CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. A Chinese proverb holds that nobody's family can hang out the sign, nothing the matter here. There's wisdom in that, don't you agree? Think about your own family. Isn't there at least one skeleton lurking in your closet? At some time and for some reason, it will surely reveal itself. The consequences have raised Cain with ruling powers, business, and even love between two persons. That is why Dr. Tom Lodge, a young resident in a Boston hospital, has long safeguarded a dark family secret from his wife, Nancy. Tom, what are you hiding? Nothing, darling. Now, that doesn't ring true. We don't have secrets between us. Or do we? All right, now, look, don't get on your high horse. Well, then don't treat me like a child. What have you done? Are you married to someone else? Is there a girl you left behind you? Did you kill someone on a hunting trip? Oh, Tom, please, tell me. I have a right to know. Our mystery drama, The Recluse, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Tony Roberts and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When we are young, family, especially our immediate family, is to us the world in microcosm. And we know that we are part of a self-contained unit in which we are fed, clothed, and protected. When we become adults, however, we can view our parents and relatives more objectively. Uncle Bill never was really that amusing, was he? And why did Father always unthinkingly vote the straight ticket? Because he read only the sport pages. And so family unity becomes subject to the strains of objective thinking, as we are about to find out. I'm home, darling. So you are. What a treat. Give me a kiss. Mm. Mm. What happened? It's only six o'clock. Did the patient die? <laughs> You're too much, Nancy. Hey, something smells good. Stew. Or call it this bourguignon. It's all the same. Oh, that's a sacrilege, and you know better. And no, the patient did not die. It was a hot appendix, and she'll be up on her feet tomorrow. Now... What's the news of the day? Well, not good. My mother? No. No, arthritis is wicked, but I don't think it's a killer. No, it's your grandmother in White River. She died this afternoon. Your mother called. I see. Your mother wants us to attend the funeral. She can't. Well, neither can I. I just can't up and leave the hospital. My mother should know that. Well... Somebody has to represent the family, and your mother and you are the only living relatives. You can't not go, Tom. You seem so unfeeling. After all, she is your grandmother. I know, I know. Didn't you like her? I thought everyone liked his grandmother. Well, sure, but... You really adored her, didn't you? Oh, come off it, Nancy. Well, first your mother sounded if she didn't care that her mother had died, and now here you are not caring either and feeling that her death is a manipulation. Hey, what are you so worked up about over this old lady? I mean, you never even met her. Maybe I'm lucky. What was Mrs. Schuyler? Some kind of witch? Uh, no. But, uh, oh, well, let it go. Hmm? Why won't you talk about her, Tom? Look, I don't remember her very well. I've, I've kind of lost track. Hey, look, let's have our... Supper will keep... You realize, don't you, that the more you evade the subject, the more you arouse my curiosity... Now, tell me about your grandmother. Well, the Schuyler family has been in White River for hundreds of years, uh, dating from before they built the inn, uh, a place named Riverfront. My grandmother's lived there all her life. An old inn? 
Oh, like the ones you see on the book covers of Gothic novels? Yeah, something like that. It's on the edge of the uh, river, and it's more than 100 years old. Twenty rooms. Most of them were closed off when the inn was closed to travelers. And you explored every one of them, didn't you? As a matter of fact, I did. But you don't remember her very well. Isn't that what you said? Okay, Doctor, what's the mystery? There, There is none. Uh, really, really. Uh, Grandma lived in three rooms, never went out. She's been a recluse since my mother and I left. Why? Heartbroken to see you go? No, not exactly. Hey, how about dropping the subject? No, sirree. There's a skeleton in the family closet, and I want to know what it is, and I'll find out tomorrow. Pardon? When we reach White River. Now, look. It's all decided. We're driving up for the funeral. But... No but about it. What is this dark secret? It goes to the grave with her. My grandmother's death has laid that skeleton to rest. Forever. You stay here, Nancy, in the waiting room. Huh? Now, I'm not sitting here while Mr. Martin reads you the will. As your wife, I'm entitled to know the provisions of your grandmother's will. Oh, what am I going to do with you? <laughs> all right, all right. Come in, come in. Uh, come in, Dr. Lodge. Ah, Mrs. Lodge. See? He expects me in his office. Well, it's nice to see you again, Tom. Thank you, sir. Uh, my wife, Nancy. How do you do? Hello. Well, sit down, if you please. It's been several years, Tom. Yes, sir. Six. And you're a doctor in a big Boston hospital. Oh, a resident. Hmm. How interesting. I telephoned your mother. She, she couldn't, couldn't be... be here for the funeral. Yes, arthritis. She's pretty much confined to her house. Yes, so she told me. A tasteful service. Simple, but reverent. Thank you for attending, Mr. Martin. Well, your grandmother was my client and a friend. Uh, you didn't know her, Mrs. Lodge? No, only by hearsay. Is that so? Hearsay, indeed. Well, Tom's told me that she was a reckless. Well, I suppose she had become so. Of course, she was an old woman and set in her ways. And... What were those, if I may ask, Mr. Martin? My grandmother was austere, self-righteous, and unforgiving. She turned her back on my mother and me six years ago, and we've never heard from her since. We learned not to care. Oh. Why, Tom? She never forgave my mother for marrying my father. Grandma considered him several cuts below her social level. Now, let's forget what's past and hear what Mr. Martin has to say. <clears throat> yes. Well, the provisions of her will are clear and simple. You, Tom, inherit her entire estate. The old inn and the 15 acres surrounding it? And the small house where Mrs. Meggs lives. Tom, it's a fortune. Well, I don't know about that, but... Well, the land is valuable, but the inn... Uh, well, it's in bad disrepair. And useless. I'm afraid that your grandmother let it go over the past few years. It's weather-worn and rotted. And mice have replaced the ghosts of all those old travelers. Well, it'll have to be raised and the land sold. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, now, uh, your grandmother left a codicil to her will, Tom, in her handwriting... Whatever is realized from the sale of the inn and the land is to be paid to the bank. But why? Was she in debt? Is that the, is that the skeleton in the lodge closet, Tom? Uh, why don't we just leave it that way, Nancy? Yes, it uh, might be best, Mrs. Lodge. But it's not the truth, is it? A woman like your grandmother, why would she get herself into debt? And, and over what? Well, a family matter. So it wasn't her debt. Tom, was it yours? Look, darling, it's really unimportant. I, I don't think it is. I, I want to understand what this is about. Did you know about this indebtedness? Is that why you and your mother lost touch with your grandmother? <clears throat> well, I, I'll file the will for probate, Tom. Uh, do you want me to uh, dispose of the inn and the land and carry out your grandmother's last wish? Yes, I'd appreciate it, Mr. Martin. Tom... How did you get into debt, and for how much? 
I really do have a right to know. If you persist, Nancy, you will regret the day you said, yes, I'll marry you. Darling, no matter what you did, I'll never regret that decision. You'd better tell her, Mr. Martin. Yes, perhaps I should. Well, um, Tom's father was assistant cashier at the Merchants Bank over there across the street. Now, six years ago, in February 1970, Tom's father... My father stole $70,000 from his bank and disappeared. And neither have been seen since, him or the money. Now, are you satisfied? Oh, Tom, darling. My mother and I were so ashamed that we slunk out of White River and I hoped I'd never have to come back here and face the old neighbors. The sins of the father. How cruel. Your grandmother renounced your mother and you for something your father did? Well, that was my grandmother's way. And now, in the codicil to her will, she makes me responsible to see that her estate is sold and the proceeds paid to the bank. I still can't be free of what my father did. I'm still made to feel guilty because he grabbed a bundle and flew the coop. Now, do you understand why I didn't want to come here for the funeral? And why I hope my father has already had his. Sit down, Ruth. Uh, a cold wind. Mm. Coming on to snow. A cup of hot tea will do you good. Uh, uh, nice of Tom to invite me to the funeral. He always was nice as a boy. Yep. Yeah, and nice wife, too. What happened now, Lil? You got any idea? Mm, he'll sell, is my guess. Except for Tom and his mother, the old lady was the last of the line. Yeah, well, that's the Scarlet family. Well, I can't complain, but it makes me feel kind of peculiar that I won't be working the land no more. Forty years. Now, how about you, Lil? You pulling up stakes? Ain't your sister Faye someplace south? L Lauderdale? I'm thinking about it. After all you did for the old woman over the years, I thought maybe she'd leave something to you. Hmm. It's a nice little house, I'd say. Not her ladyship. She was a tight one. Well, I better get up to the inn and light a fire for him. Every once in a while on a snowy night, I, I wonder what happened to him, Lil. To the father? Yeah. Snowbound. The car found stuck in the snow next morning. No sign of him or the money. Where'd he get to, Lil? All I remember is he stormed out of the inn and disappeared. Yeah, that's what I mean. Gone. Without a trace. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, it's just Ruth's dog. I'll chain him up in the barn. Thanks, Mrs. Maggs. Anything else I can do? I left bacon and eggs in the refrigerator and then... Oh, nothing. Thank you. That's fine. Well, then I'll say good night and get back while I can see my way. We'll have snow. I wouldn't wander around, Tom. The old place is falling apart and some of the floors ain't too firm. I'll say good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, creepy. I hate this place. There's been a pall over it ever since what happened. I'll tell you one thing, Nancy. I am not spending the night in this, uh, this mausoleum did happen to your father. How could he have gotten away? Search me. Police went all over the inn for days. There was no trace of him. You lived here as a boy? Yeah, sure. My friends and I used to play games here. You know, hide and seek. I remember those days. And you were the hero. <laughs> I mean, did you ever hide where no one could find you? Oh, well, there were lots of places... Cubby holes, uh, one room with a false wall, uh, trap doors and some ceilings. Oh. It's a wonder one of us was never found. Maybe that's what happened, Tom. Huh? But did you have a special hiding place? You knew the old inn better than anybody else. Good Lord. The sealed room. The, the, the what? Yeah, the seal room beneath the long clothes closet off the entry hall. Oh, but... No, it's impossible. Is it? If your father couldn't have gotten away because of the snowstorm, he must still be here. 
or what's left of him. Well, what have we here? Old deeds have a way of coming to light. And the skeleton in your closet can be made to rattle because of an inquiring mind. If a major premise and a minor premise are true, so is the logical conclusion. Tom Lodge's father disappeared. It was impossible for him to have left the old inn. Therefore, he never left the inn. I will return shortly with Act Two. unusual and unlikely for a person to disappear and never be heard of again. Exceptions are rare. Rip Van Winkle, to be sure, but that was fantasy. Dr. Livingston, and that was fact, both were presumed to be lost, but after their disappearance, neither was accused of a crime. Tom Lodge's father was. He absconded with $70,000, and therein lies a difference. He was a criminal and in danger. What happened to him? Tom Lodge hopes to find out. Strike another match, Nancy, and I'll let myself down the ladder. Haven't we got a flashlight? Uh, in the car. I'll get it later. I want to see if anything's in there right now. You could slip and break a leg, Tom. No, 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 no. The ladder's strong. Let's strike a match. It's really black down here. I can't see a thing. Well, I'll hand the matches to you. I'm flat on the floor on my stomach. Reach up. Okay. Now, let me see. Oh, darling, be careful. Don't worry. Oh, there's the pot-bellied stove and the wood scuttle. And a chair. Small table. Cut. Good Lord. Oh, what is it, Tom? Tom, answer me. I'm coming up. Tom? Yeah. Look, let's, let's get back to the common room. Tell me. Did you, is, is there something there? My father. The, uh, his, his bones. A clothed skeleton. Oh, oh how horrible. I've got to think. You said that the police went all over the inn, Tom. How, how could they have missed the sealed room? I don't know. Nobody remembered it, probably. Well, what was it for? The caretaker. Back around the turn of the century, he acted as a registration clerk and a handyman, and uh, he, he lived down there. In that hole in the ground? Yes. It's a real room with flooring and walls of wood, and it, it was very snug and warm. After he closed the inn for the night, he lifted the trap door and the long closet in the hall and pulled it closed after him. I see. Then the flooring in the closet was covered over. With carpeting, and that sealed it off. Unless a person knew a room was down there, uh, he'd never find it. But you did, as a boy. Was the floor covered over then? Uh, I don't think so. No. So... The carpeting was laid over the trapdoor recently. Six years ago? Right after your father disappeared? Yeah. Your grandmother must have known about the room, Tom. Yes, of course. Would Mrs. Meggs have known about the sealed room? I don't know. Why? Well, who, who was here the night your father disappeared? No one. Uh, my grandmother and Mrs. Meggs. And, of course, my father. Your father stole money. He came here, and six years later we find his remains in a sealed room. Why did he hide? And why did he die? I can't answer those questions, Nancy. We'll never know the answers. I know one of them. He came here and told your grandmother he'd stolen money from his bank. Why would he tell her? No idea. What? If he'd been dipping into your grandmother's money and was caught and stole from the bank in order to replace it. 
Well, that's far out. But your grandmother refused the money. That's why she wanted the proceeds from her estate to go to the bank to help repay a debt of honor. Hey, that's pretty far-fetched, darling. Maybe. I have the answer to another one of my questions. Your father hid here because he couldn't get away. Was he a healthy man, Tom? Yes. Why? How did he die? There he was, safe in the sealed room. Did he have a stroke, a heart attack? Did somebody bring him food? Mrs. Maggs? Could be. Tom, get the flashlight and let's examine that room carefully. Oh, I feel like I'm in a tomb. It's my father, all right. Look, where I'm shining the light, you see this break in the skull? Oh. Now, that's how he died, Nancy. He was struck a hard blow. He was murdered. And look at this. His watch. Huh. See, the strap's rotted, but it's his watch, all right. Look, his initials are on the back. Oh, let's get out of here. In a minute. Now, it's my turn to ask a question. What became of the money? The 70 grand? Well, whoever murdered him took it. That was the motive. Yeah, but it was hot money, Nancy. It was hard to use for a long time. And the sealed room would be an ideal place to hide it. Where? Where could it be hidden? And I went over the mattress on the cot. It's not there. And the small closet is empty. Well, let me see. In the stove? No, well, why not? Tom! How about that? Look at this wad of money. Wrapped in oil skin. Oh, I'm afraid, Tom. Leave that money and, and, and close off the room. Well, there's only 15000 55000 is gone. Someone squirreled it away. Tom, let's go back to the hotel and think it through. Okay, okay. I'll telephone my mother. Uh, maybe she'll know the answers to some of our questions. Gee, you are scared, aren't you, darling? Of course I am. Someone committed a murder for money. We found it. If the murderer discovers that we know, he may try to kill us. There, there, Shark. Down, boy, down. Thanks, Lou. Have a chance to talk with Tom? Nothing to talk about, Ruth. What's on your mind? Well, if he don't sell the land, maybe I could tenant farm it for him. I'd say he'd want to sell. Yeah. Well, if I had two dimes to rub together, I'd buy it. Oh, you can always get work, Ruth, so you said. Yeah. May change your mind? Oh, I've been thinking about it, that's all. I'm getting on. The winter's around here mighty rugged. I wonder if they could use me down south. Sure. An experienced field hand like you, I'd say so. Why, what you got you thinking about moving south? <laughs> I guess you did, Lou. Talking about your sister down in Lauderdale. <laughs> That's where you're going, ain't it? Oh, I think so. Of course, if the old lady had left me the house. But she didn't. You got money laid aside? Ooh, a little. I could help you out, Ruth. Not with much, but enough to give you a stay. Oh, no, it's mighty nice of you, Lou. When are you thinking of heading on down south? Soon as I can sell my furniture and pack, we could spell each other at the wheel. Yeah. Well, I'd like that. Then it's settled. Well, I'll be back after I make quick inspection about the inn. If the snow's piling up, maybe I could drive Tom's car down here and put it in the barn. Otherwise, it might get stuck in the morning. Oh, yes, that's true. It's happened before. Yep, I remember. Tom's father. Chains. That's what you need in heavy snow. Mr. Martin had them. The lawyer? Yeah. He left that night around 10 o'clock. I saw him drive away. Chains. That's what got him through. You didn't know he'd been to the inn. Thanks, Mother. This has been very helpful. Well? My father did manage my grandmother's money, and he had begun to dip into it. So he dipped into the bank to repay her. That's why he absconded with all that money. How did he think he'd get away with robbing the bank? Oh, who knows? Your grandmother must have been furious. Well, it was through her that he got his job at Merchant's. 
Must have loved your mother very much. Yes. Well, I'm afraid he wasn't much of a banker. Oh, it's all tragic, and they're both dead because a willful old matriarch couldn't form him into her own image. Well, let's pay a visit to Mr. Martin, huh? I'll turn this money over to him, and uh, he can give it to the bank. Fifteen thousand? What about the rest? It's gone. Can't be traced now. I wonder. Mm, the snow is beautiful. Yeah, you won't think so if it doesn't light up, darling. Driving is no fun in the North Country. Uh, come in, come in. Thank you. Forgive us for uh, calling at your home. Well, perfectly all right. Oh, what a charming room. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, let me get right to the point, Mr. Martin. I found the remains of my father in a sealed room. What? Your your father? He'd been murdered. In heaven's name. And here is 15 of the $70,000 he stole from the bank. Oh, you... You stagger me, Tom. Well, he didn't disappear. He was murdered and hidden in the sealed room, and the money, most of it, was taken away. I came to you... Well, of course, of course. I... I'll notify the police in the morning. Not tonight. We're in danger, Mr. Martin. Danger? I don't see how. Well, if the murderer finds out what we've discovered, he'll come after us. Well, who knows about your discovery? Well, no one. Except you, of course. You didn't speak to Mrs. Meggs? No. Why not? Well, we think that she must know something about all this. She was in the house the night my father vanished. You know that, Mr. Martin. I do. Well, that's what my mother says. I talked to her half an hour ago, and uh, she had had it from a uh, roof box. She'd had what from roof? That you were at the inn. He saw you drive away. Oh, that. Well, yes, now that you remind me, I'd, I'd driven out to see your grandmother, but I left quite early. May I ask a question? I don't mean to be impertinent, but... Were you aware that Tom's father was stealing from his mother-in-law? Well, goodness, no. You didn't check her account periodically? Well, very seldom. I, I thought it was in good hands. Your father's. My father stole for the purpose of making investments. You were his broker. Didn't you ever wonder where he was getting his money? You're on dangerous ground, young man. I know it, Mr. Martin, but we mean two different things. I'm not worried about slander. I'm worried about my skin. Nancy's and mine. We're in danger, and I think you know it. Two hundred years ago, Samuel Johnson remarked, There is nothing which has been contrived by man through which so much happiness is produced as by a good tavern or inn. True enough. All gone now swallowed up in progress, including Riverfront, an old New England inn which has now divested itself of a murder and its remains. There are more surprises when I return shortly with Act Three. Other sins can only speak. Murder shrieks out. That metaphor by John Webster from his 16th century play, The Duchess of Malfi, best expresses the repugnance we feel when we learn that someone has been murdered. Murder cries to be solved. And Dr. Tom Lodge confronts one, that of his long-missing father. We still have three suspects, and one of them is the handyman at Riverfront, Rufus Boggs. Lord almighty heaven, help us. Oh, go on, open up. Come in, Ruth. Oh, no. Oh, what's wrong? You're white as the snow. He was there all the time, Lil. What were you talking about? Tom's father. You sound crazy. Now sit down and go slow. Now what's this about Tom's father? I found him in a room in the cellar. Tom's father? I was going round the inn. I was riverside when they drove off, leaving all the lights on, and I went up to the door, and it wasn't closed tight. 
I opened it and called hello. And then me and Shark stepped inside and he began to bark and the hair went up on his back. Scared me stiff. Go on. He ran into that old hall closet and barked his head off. There's a trap door there. Did you know that, Lil? No. A trap door to where? Well, a room, sort of, under the common room. I had my flashlight, so I, I kneeled down and played the light around it. And I saw it. A skeleton. Oh, my. Stretched out on a cot. Oh. Which could give me a terrible turn. A skeleton? <laughs> Tom's father. <gasps> it has to be. That's where he's been these six years. And they drove away? That's right. Well, we'll have the police swarming all over the place soon, and there'll be questions like, what do I know about it? And, and I don't know nothing, Lil, nothing. Neither do I. Now, you leave the talking to me. All I know is Tom's father bolted out of the house and slammed the door behind him. That's the last anybody's seen of him. And I was in the barn all evening, except when I left my room to quiet shark. And that's when I seen Mr. Martin drive away. His car, anyway. Well, we'd better go back up there, Ruth. What for? Well, they found out the murder. He was murdered? Well, well that's my guess. The, the man wouldn't just stay in there and starve himself to death. No, I guess you're right. Uh, Tom and the wife made the discovery, and, and you can bet whoever killed his father is going to do something about it. Like what? Like get that evidence out of there and then kill them. Now, we've got to stop that, Ruth. What, what's, the, what's the gun for? Well, I may need it. Why don't we wait for the police? No, no, no. No, there's no time. There's no time at all. There was a message at the hotel desk. Mrs. Meggs telephoned. She has to see me, and she's driving into town. When did she call? Half an hour ago. Sure to be here any minute. <laughs> you were pretty rough on Mr. Martin, darling. Yeah, but his role strikes me as funny. I mean, funny, odd. Look, he was my father's friend and broker. He must have wondered where the money was coming from for those stocks my father bought. On the other hand, uh, people up here pretty much mind their own business. Oh, it's all very confusing. Not all of it. There was a murder. Miss... Mrs. Meggs. Ah. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, the most dreadful thing's happened. Ruth. It's... Ruth's killed himself. Oh, no. Killed himself? You found him out, and that's why he did it. You found the room and the skeleton. Where did you find Ruth? At the inn. The door was unlocked. I went in with Shark and turned on a light. And there he was, Ruth stretched out on the floor, dead, shot in the head. I near fainted. I ran back to my house. I didn't know what to do. You didn't call the police? Well, I phoned you. Well, then I chained Shark in the barn... And went into Ruth's room. And I... I found the money. He had... He had hidden it in his room? Well, not all of it. Just about $5,000. I... I can't believe it, Tom. I can't believe it. I brought it to give it to you. Ruth Boggs. He was such a gentle old man. Gosh, I don't believe it either. He, he killed himself because he was found out. Yeah. Well, uh... I guess that should clear up the mystery. You'd better stay here in the hotel, Mrs. Meggs. And oh. I'll get you a room. No, no, no. I'll go back and, and be there when the police come. And the ambulance. I, oh, I'm half out of my head with grief, Tom. Yes, it's a terrible shock. Oh. Well, we'll be out in the morning if we can get through. Oh, they'll have the roads cleared. Never fear. I don't know what to say. Good Good night. That's a blow. Roof Parks. Gosh, I've known him since I was a little boy. Kind and patient. He was a little slow, but he was a good man. He must have gone off his trolley. Mrs. Meggs is a liar. Nancy, your imagination... It's lucky for you I've got some. Ask yourself a few questions, darling. But from what you remember, did Ruth ever go into that inn? Oh, well, rarely... 
But, uh, well, he, look, he saw us drive off, and uh, maybe we, we left the light on us. So he goes in, finds the skeleton, and shoots himself? Well, that's what Mrs. Meg says. His dog is always with him? Sure. So the dog went into the inn with him? Go on. Then how come Mrs. Meg's heard the dog howling outside? Mrs. Meggs had said goodnight to us. Why did she want to return to the inn? Not for the reason she gave, Tom. I think Ruth told her what he found, and they returned to the inn together, and she shot him. That's crazy. Is it? What about this? Where did she find the $5,000? In his room. Just like that? She could walk into Ruth's room and just like that find $5,000? If he'd stolen the money, he'd have hidden it. Yeah, well, all right, that's the point. Uh, her story does sound kind of pat, doesn't it? Sure, because it's a lie. Darling, she murdered Ruth just as she murdered your father six years ago. All right, but just saying it doesn't make it so. I mean, how do we prove it? Two ways. The police can check on the gun used to kill Ruth. And they can also help us to find the rest of the money. I kept asking myself, where did it all go? Well, for all I knew, we just flew away. Oh, that's what I think, too. Are you... Are you serious? Very. The money flew away? Yes. You give me a day with the police, and I think I can find that money. And when I do, we'll put Mrs. Meggs behind bars for life. <laughs> Nancy, where have you been? I've been worried to death. I told you where I'd be, darling, with the police. You want to hear something interesting? Now go ahead. Every time your father placed a stock order, he placed a similar one from Mr. Martin and paid for all of it. What? That's right. I'll make a guess. Your father and Martin were in collusion. Your father used your grandmother's money with Martin's tacit approval. You mean the two of them were dipping into the old woman's funds? That's what it looks like to me. Your grandmother demanded an accounting, and to repay her, your father robbed his bank. Oh, gosh, it gets worse and worse. But it's going to get better and better, darling, because the police have supplied me with two very helpful pieces of information. The gun? Yes, they traced the gun. Rufus Boggs never had a handgun, as far as the police can tell. But old man Meggs did... And he had a permit to carry it. The permit expired when he died, but the gun was never turned in. It was Meg's gun which was used to murder Rufus. Well, I should clinch it. Without question. She murdered Ruth. But what about your father? Uh, were the police helpful there? Oh, very. D did you know that Mrs. Meg's has a sister living in Fort Lauderdale? No. Well, she has, and they are very regular correspondents. Remember what you said, Tom? That maybe the money just flew away? Yeah. Well, it did. Can't you guess? You're telling me that... Exactly. Now, let's call on her and see if she doesn't fall apart. Well, it's still beyond me. Killing your father and then taking his own life. Is that what you think he did, Mrs. Mace? Why, it's plain as the nose on your face, Tom. But why would a man shoot himself unless he was guilty of some terrible crime? Mm, I guess you're right. Mm. I've decided to sell the estate, Mrs. Meggs, because I'm tied down in Boston and I just couldn't manage the place from there. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry about that. You've uh, lived here. Uh, rent free for over 30 years. That was part of the agreements when Meggs and me moved out here. Yes, I know. Well, if you would like to stay on. I... No, no, thanks. I don't want charity. Have you thought about what you're going to do? Well, Meg's left me a little insurance, and I kept it tucked away. I might move to where it's a little warmer than up here. Arizona, maybe. Not Florida? Pardon me? Isn't that uh, where your sister is? Why do you ask? Your sister confessed that there are five savings accounts in Fort Lauderdale Banks in your name, Mrs. Banks. And the police here in White River want you to explain how it happens that there is a small fortune waiting for you down there. Over $15,000. Yes. 
It's no business of theirs. Oh, yes, it is. I found 15,000 in the stove in the sealed room. You placed five more where you said Roof had hidden it, 20,000. That plus the 15 makes $35,000. Half the amount my father stole from the merchant's bank. How do you explain that, Mrs. Meggs? And how do you explain that the bullet that killed Rufus Boggs was fired by your handgun? My handgun? I never in my life owned a handgun. Your husband did, and he didn't fire that shot from the grave, did he? You murdered Roof to save your skin, Mrs. Meggs, so you'd better tell me and tell me quick what happened six years ago to my father. I didn't touch him. He didn't crush his own skull, Mrs. Meggs. Martin killed him. His friend, Martin. Uh Uh-huh. That's more like it. Go on. Your father came to give your grandmother money. She turned him away. He had the money with him. Martin spoke to me, said he'd divide it. Half for him and half for me. I was afraid. Ah, I'll just bet you were. Well, then he struck your father and killed him. We hid the body in the sealed room. And from time to time, you dipped into your half of the money and sent it to your sister for deposit. And you murdered Ruth to cover the old crime. Well, I didn't know what to do. I was crazy with fear. I just lost my head. I doubt that, Mrs. Meggs. You deliberately murdered the old man. Tom... Please, be merciful. If you and Martin don't hang for the crime, the court will be merciful. You're cold-blooded killers. You deserve to die. The thief who understands his business never steals in his own neighborhood. An old Arab precept. But greed and opportunity usually go hand in hand. What a killer does not understand are the consequences of premeditated murder. Not for the victim, but for his relatives and friends. There are degrees of crime, from petty thievery to grand larceny. But murder is the worst and most repugnant. I will draw the curtain on the recluse when I return shortly. The 1977 Buick Regal. It comes with Buick's terrific V6 engine. It carries six people and lots of Buick comfort. It's lean. It's maneuverable in city traffic. It's the most luxurious mid-sized car Buick builds. Yeah, this new Regal is pretty much everything a car should be. Except for one thing. It isn't yours yet. But it can be. Just see your Buick dealer for a test drive. Soon. and his mother had lived for six years under a pall of shame. But then two deaths lifted the curtain, and the truth was revealed. What Tom's father did was wrong. What was done to him was worse. I can report with pleasure that Mrs. Meggs and Martin were sentenced to prison for life. And for all I know, they are still there, still a burden to taxpayers like you and me. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Patricia Elliott, Francis Sternhagen, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Where shall we go, Cap? Down the steps behind the trees. There's a little piazza. I'm so worried about you, darling. Maybe you really are sick. You just don't sound like yourself. Your voice is so strange... Not cab. We won't need the champagne anymore. Or this special masquerade. No, I am not sure, Mr. Goodwin. Who are you? Just a man with a purpose. You can see that I have exchanged the champagne glasses for this. A gun? Which I would not hesitate to use. Lovely as you are. I am a desperate man, so keep walking. Across the driveway and around behind the Lombardy poplars. That's it. Don't try to do anything foolish. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater.
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>